Here we go, baby. You know how we do. Let's do it. <laughs> you know how we do. I got to see if I can make this public. I want to make this public. But in the meantime, just for my friends, I got to give the people, <laughs> I give the people what they want. Once again, welcome. This is episode 20, Sports Debate Tuesday. Jason DeBeers, Rob McLean. Um, Rob, um, did you see the main event for the weekend? I did. I did. God, she's a savage, huh? Oh, I, mm, yeah, I mean, I love Aunt Amanda Nunez. I just think she's so before her time, you know? Like, <sighs> girls don't throw like that, you know? Girls do not throw like that. That's why I would love to have seen the Cejudo versus Nunez because, whew. Yeah, man. Cejudo better girls, go for a takedown. <laughs> exactly. Well, here's two very important things I got from the main event, and you and me are going to talk about that, then we're going to talk about another match of interest, which, are, which were separate. The thing I got from the main event were two things. One... Amanda Nunez showed um, her greatness. If we remember her against Cyborg, we thought it could be a bad matchup for Cyborg because she's a woman that likes to push forward one two one two, you know, and an, an occasional body kick against someone who's a counter striker. And then when she gets you, she one twos. And if she, she can finish, she finish. And if she doesn't, she assess the damage and then keeps sniping you. And what she did to this young lady, Felicia Spencer, for five rounds was snipe this woman to a point where even the commentators are like, "What's the point in going out there round five? Maybe she just cut your losses, stop the stop the fight." But we both no, you know, that's not what the coaches are going to do. We both know that's not what Felicia Spencer was going to do, uh, right? She's she's a, a legit warrior. She's a badass Canadian. And uh, I mean, five, five to zero, Amanda Nunez. Uh, I got to say this, though. I mean, I don't think that maybe she put herself in the position to be there. But, uh, yeah, man, I mean, I wasn't seeing the most technical punches being thrown. You know, they were coming from over the top of her head. You know, like, I just, the, the, the level of talent was not on the same level as Amanda Nunez. And that's been for the last uh, couple fights, and no disrespect to, you know... Uh, Basically everybody. You know, <laughs> yeah, Holly Holm, you know, great fighter, but still just a, a kind of like a counterfighter, just like Amanda Nunez, and is just not on her level. Uh, you know, Chris Cyborg, like you're saying, she And Amanda's has, more complete than Holm is, right? Her jiu-jitsu's nasty. Exactly. We don't know there's, a lot, like, there's a lot more to her, and she's a lot more fluid. She's a lot... She, uh, Holly Holm is pretty stiff. You know, she's got some aspects to her game, but like you said, there's holes. Um, Cyborg is it? Cyborg is, you know, again, like you said, she's an aggressive fighter, and Amanda Nunez is a counter puncher. Like, that is just laying right into her lap. You know? That was basically Ronda against Holm, right? All over yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just like, you're just, it's just, it's just going to happen, you know? Um, and then even before that, I mean, just all of her opponents have been. I guess it's just that that the the, the women's game, you know, the, the equalizer really is the power, um, and, and probably on all levels, you know. So it's a uh, it's it's a different game, and we're just getting to see like what what a champion means in, in the women's game as opposed to a champion in the men's game, you know. No, no doubt. Um, yeah, the, um, I really really like that she realized that this woman is not easy to finish. And sometimes, Chel, Chel Sonnen once said, um, if you go for the knockout, you can lose. You can very well lose a decision. <laughs> so, Definitely. So, yeah, it's like if she's there and she's going for it and she's assessing the damage and the girl's still, still there and still coming at her, you got to wait. You can't gas yourself. Because one of the, the second point I was going to bring up is that Amanda um, had a long storied history in the past, which seems like the distant past these days, uh, of gassing out. She finished people earlier, and if she doesn't, she goes on kind of survival mode, maybe rides it out a little bit. And you saw her do that a little bit at the, uh, in, the, in the fifth round. It's like 10 seconds. You know, maybe there's a little bit of mercy mercy killing going on. Like, I don't want to hurt this girl anymore. Let me just hold her. I can't finish her. You know, the ref's not going to stop her, so let me just hold it down, lock it down, and get my 50 to 44 decision. Whatever judge gave gave it 50 to 45 needs their head examined because there were at least one or two 10-8 rounds. That's just ridiculous. They were, they were just uh, one-sided beatings, okay? please yeah. please exciting card though exciting card. card lived up to the hype everyone thought it was just like a one a one fight main event that uh, just the main event was the only thing anyone was interested in seeing and amanda's starting to sell more and more because she's getting her tv exposure um god bless long overdue because she is the true lioness she is a, the true queen of the jungle and as we mentioned before this the ones the only one that's even come close was uh shevchenko 
There was a three-round fight, right, that Shevchenko won the third, Amanda Gast, and then there was a five-round fight for the title. Um, airtight, man, airtight. Some people thought Shev won. I didn't, but it wasn't, right? And nobody got screwed. <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, I think it was definitely a... Uh, it was close enough when no one got, gone no either got way. Yeah. I think it went the right way. Um, unfortunate. I mean... I have to watch that fight again because my feeling on it that that night in that in that moment was that you know Shevchenko won that fight because she was connecting and was a bit more aggressive. But that's just yeah. I'd have to go back and watch it, you know. Just and, and watching it is not marking, you know, is not judging it either, you know. It's been a long time so. ago. I mean, if if I had to go on my old man memory, I thought Amanda won the first three. Um, but I got, let's, hey, you know what? Let's go back and watch that. In fact, let's do a little, we'll do a little quarantine as this, as time goes on. We will watch that together as MMA people. I really, really appreciate and respect what you're doing, you know? Um, so speaking of MMA, Rob, got the little Bruce Lee documentary, documentary. Be water, my friend. (laughs) Be like water. Not many men can withstand my punch. (laughs) I think that was actually a Wu Tang Clan thing. That wasn't. I don't think that was Bruce Lee. So, uh, I'm trying to get my ass together. All right. So, watching the documentary, whether you watch the documentary, whether you whether you watch all of it or some of it, um, a lot of people felt that Bruce Lee made a major impact in uh, combat sports and mixed martial arts, Thai Thai boxing, uh, um, pride, um, glory, kick fighting, kick kickboxing, uh, bo- just regular boxing, and, and our wheelhouse. What we're talking about right now is mixed martial arts. What impact do you think, if any? Um, well, we agree it's some, but what impact do you think Bruce Lee has made on the sport of mixed martial arts? I think he made so many impacts on not only the sport but you know how people view themselves how athlete treats themselves how people cross boundaries you know how people cross uh, societal boundaries even uh, sporting boundaries where you know some sports kept away from other sports for such a long time and now everybody cross trains everybody goes to the same place it's more about performance than it is about the sport and skill i think he he's transcended uh physical like human performance that's that's what I think it is for him is that he just took himself he wanted to take himself to a different place and that again goes to his uh, his foundations in uh, martial arts about bettering yourself and being a, a, a morally different and better person um, and then put that into life and then it just flourished from there and he met people and did things and um, just crazy crazy mindset and. For me, every aspect of Bruce Lee is MMA. You know, if you talk about mindset, if you talk about work ethic, if you talk about skill and uh, learning different aspects of every part of everything in, involved in his craft, uh, and, and then innovating off of that, not just learning it, but understanding it and uh, making something different from that. So uh, I don't think you can stop learning from Bruce Lee in the MMA department, but um, there's so much you can learn from him in his life. And uh, it's so sad that it was tragically ended so early. And uh, just another person who could have lived a lot longer and, and gave a lot more to, 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 you know, our race. Rob McLean, if he didn't pass away, is there any doubt in our minds that, that man, given his conditioning and probably, I don't know anything about his nutrition, but the way he led his life, uh, where um, if, there was, if there was any moment of stress, there was stress relief. There's no doubt in my mind he'd still be alive today, <laughs> all right? He'd still be like young looking. He'd be like um, the oldest Gracie who's like 90 years old doing freaking 90 push-ups. Right. One push-up for each year. That guy does 90 push-ups. Uh, I, his name escapes me, and maybe I'll just tag it up when we do, um, when, we do the, uh, the, uh, when the broadcast comes back up on YouTube or, or um, on the NY Varsity Sports or comes up on iTunes or Spotify. Maybe I'll just tag the name. But he, I, I think of the older Gracie when I think of Bruce Lee. As far as discipline, as far as having respect, as far as being a better version of yourself, as far as um, offering what you do best uh, and showing the world who you're, who you're about. Every time I think of Bruce Lee, every time I think of Enter the Dragon, every time I, think, I think of Return of the Dragon, a uh, little Chuck Norris thing, or whatever movie that was that had Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, I think about UFC 1. Where I think the Gracies, you know, you got these guys. This guy's a boxer. That guy's an elite wrestler. This guy's a, 
You had one, some asshole out there with one boxing glove on and one off. I, just, I found out why, though. I found that he, got a, he had a title shot against Hearns and was offered millions and millions of dollars and didn't want to hurt his hand in MMA. So he wore the boxing glove on his power hand so he doesn't break his hand. Because if he breaks his hand, he, can't, he, he can kiss X amount All of million, millions, millions of dollars. Goodbye. goodbye. So the thing I got from Bruce Lee is kind, uh, um, kind of the same thing. And I don't mean to cheapen his, um, his aura and all the things he's done to, to inspire the uh, people, particularly children and, and older people who stay back and sh- who want to stay in shape. I don't mean to cheapen it by mentioning the Gracies, but every, it's like every time I see UFC 1, it's a new style. We've never seen it before. Oh, my God. That dude weighed a uh, Hoist Gracie. Uh, he outweighed him by like 70 pounds and he lost. Not only did he lose, he tapped out. Call quit. Call it quits. How? Show me how. What is that called? Same thing with Kung Fu. Oh, same, and same thing with his, his martial art. Uh, and the thing that separates Bruce uh, uh, Lee from the other Gracies, at least at that time, was he was open to new ideas. The Gracies were very closed minded in, in, in a way that this is our way. It's worked. So you know it since it works, it's the only way. You know, and you and I talked last week where like one dimensional fighters from UFC one all the way up to blah, blah, blah. are like, OK, now we get two dimensional fighters. We got wrestlers, but the wrestler learned some boxing. Now he can use his hands as long as he doesn't fall in love with it. Take down the jujitsu guy. You're going to get submitted. Right. So wrestlers were good because they could take down the strikers who were more elite. And they could take and they could. um, um knock out jiu-jitsu artists because they knew they didn't have the hands. <laughs> yep. So it became this one-dimensional thing to two, to, to people learning two things. Jiu-jitsu guys had to learn striking. Wrestlers had to learn striking. It all, it all starts in his feet. And now, Rob, if you're not a complete fighter, you're, you're, you're effed. Yeah. You're effed. <clears throat> Eff. Troop. Effed. Well, even, maybe, maybe not before the top 15 in each weight, you know, in each weight class. You well, know, but some once of the you get to the top 15, just, you know, like, some people yeah. can get away with it. Damian people, Maya. Exactly. You yeah. know, Damian Maya, you have like a, who is, um, goodness, I can't think of his name right now, but yeah, there's just a lot of uh, ben fighters Askren. who are, yeah. you know, yeah, Ben Askren, that's perfect. Who And then there's other fighters who are just, have every tool in the belt, like a Demetrius Johnson, you know, one of like, just crazy, you know, so. Mighty Mouse. Ooh. Oh my God! I guess what? Damn, Rob, you just steering you steering the wheel for me today, man. You are saving me from myself. So now I'm gonna shut the f up. The next question is next subject matter, because we touched on active fighters today, uh, uh, fighters in this weight class, talking about Connor, who's by the way retired uh, um, today or yesterday or a couple of days ago. I talked about Ron. To talk about this person, Rob McLean. I'm gonna should I. Maybe I'll go first on this one. I'm, an, I'm, I'm, just, yeah, I'm just wound up. Rob, the question is, who are the top five mixed martial artists of all time? Now, before I give you my five, Rob, I want to uh, give props and honorable mention to people like Fedor, who's on around Mount Rushmore, but not a GOAT, okay? Uh, to Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor, who transcend the sport. Transcending mean meaning that people that don't watch MMA know who they are. Okay, I told Mark Schumerman, a uh, uh, volleyball, uh, uh, the 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 MC guy, announcer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I said volleyball players aren't interesting, and he took so such a big exception to that. But I think he misinterpreted. Like volleyball players, the uh, like, like, very few volleyball players transcend the sport. You got Kerry, you got Karch, and what else? Right, the the ball guy nobody knows. Okay, um, so now with that being said, with all these honorable mentions and me jumping from one sport back into MMA, these are my top. Five. Number five, Rob McLean, McLean, Amanda Nunez. Okay? Who says the top five have to be men? No. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. All the single ladies. But you know what? She's married to a hot chick named Nina Ansaroff. Okay? (laughs) Two. All the double ladies. She's married to a hottie who, by the way, fights at 115, who who is a top 10 fighter, Nina Ansaroff. Amanda Nunez, starched. Um, uh, Chris Cyborg, face planted. Amanda Nunez starched Ronda Rousey, hit her on the hit her on the cheek, and the rest saw enough. Amanda Nunez starched Misha Tate until he, she put her in a rear naked choke. Then Misha just said, "You know what? Forget this title stuff, man. I think I'm going to retire." 
starched Holly Holm, who has never been knocked out in the, in the his, uh, and has been hit hard enough by Shevchenko and God knows who else uh, uh, fought Cyborg, never been knocked out. Uh, Jer- Jermaine Durandamy, never been knocked out by any of those people. Got starched by 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 the way, a head kick. Her specialty, Amanda <laughs> Nunez, and the only reason why she's not higher up is because her success at fighting the best of the best has happened such a, such a short time, and she is like Alexander the Great right now because she is weeping because there are no worlds left to conquer. My number four might be your number one, and you're going to shake your head through my whole diatribe, Anderson Silva. The man lives in the Matrix, okay? The Matrix movie comes out. If Keanu Reeves can't do the role, Give it to Anderson Silva. You don't have to slow down the camera for that man. You do not have to have a stunt double for that man. That man can do his own stunts. The most memorable thing I've ever seen, and we've seen a bunch. We've seen him finish Forrest Griffin with a jab, who, by the way, fought at uh, 205, not 195. Vitor Belfort. That karate kid kick, or that little, that little, that little front kick on v, on a jacked up TRT induced Vitor Belfort, dropped him, cold cocked him, beat Dan Henderson. Dan Henderson's tongue was sticking out of his face, choked him. Who was who was the who was the two division tri, a pride champion? Anderson Silva is to be remembered and to be respected. Got I gotta move on because I know you gotta do yours. Number three. Demetrius Johnson, here I come to save the day. <laughs> that means that Mighty Mouse is on the way. Only three losses. One of those losses by a very controversial split decision to Henry Cejudo, a guy who, who by the way, he starched with a sternum kick in the first round. Said, I wish there was a trilogy, trilogy to that because it's only fair that this number three greatest of all time who leads the UFC in total title title defenses will not be broken. Consecutive title defenses, it's not going to be broken. John's been stripped, so he he has he, he doesn't have consecutive. Anderson Silva is the record he broke. Demetrius Johnson, 12 for me one time, 12 for me two times, 12 for me three times, 12 for me four times, 12 for me five times. DJ, you're my number three. Number two, John. Bones Jones. The man only has one loss on his career. It was a disqualification loss to Matt Hamill, which, by the way, well, I thought I thought was his most dominant wrestling performance against an NCAA champ. John Jones beat Shogun. Beat him. He'd be higher on my list if Shogun was at his prime at that time. But since he's had the title, he's beaten Rampage at his prime. A full camp, no excuses. He's beaten Rashad Evans at his prime. Full camp, no excuses. Beat Stefan Struve, which a lot of people thought Stefan won that match. Redid it, knocked him out. Beat Daniel Cormier, redid it, head kick. Uh, body kick, body kick, head kick, knocked him out. Um, some very, very close split decisions with Santos and with Reyes, which... Leads him to my number two. He, he could have been number one. And, and many, many MMA experts think I'm crazy. He's the greatest of all time. But Rob, this is my number one. I'm not, that imp- I'm not impressed with your performance. It is GSP, George Rush, St. Pierre. George's only two losses were to two guys named Matt. Matt Serra, who, who knocked him out, which was the, bit of the, the greatest upset of all time, but in the rematch, uh, breaks the record in MMA attendance in, uh, on this side of the world, at least, with Holly Holm and, and Ronda holding the, the, the first one, and finished Matt Serra where the ref saw it enough. Also, early in his career, got, got caught with five seconds left in an arm bar by Matt Hughes. Beat him the second time, head kick, and then a third time made Matt Hughes verbal tap. Because his arms were trapped where he couldn't tap. He had to say tap, 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 tap. And then consecutive title match after consecutive title match after conse- consecutive title match. Has not lost a round until basically John, Johnny Hendricks, which might drop him on some people's list because everyone thought Johnny won that match. I thought, I thought GSP won, won one, three, and four. Comes back. Does a service to humanity and shuts up the biggest mouth in MMA, Michael Bisbing, who, to his credit, decided not to tap out, wanted to go out. Moves up a weight class. Champ, champ. My butt hurts from, my butthole hurts from gaining all this weight. Got to retire again. My number one, GSP. Rob <laughs> McLean, who, 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 who are your top five? So, my top five, uh, number five is actually... John Jones. Um, I have him up there just because, uh, you know, and just to preface before I start this, 
uh, I kind of left out all the earlier days, you know, the Gracies, the, um, you know, the Randy Couture's, the Chuck Liddell's, the Tito Ortiz, you know, all these guys because, you know, it's tough. They're pioneers, you know. You can just put and they're you know, Mount, their names and they're Mount Rushmore's. Yeah. Um, exactly. Sorry, you know. So it's just I, I'm putting it more as you know, not only the the length of their career, but the peak of their skill at the, at the best of their times, you know. Because again, Anderson Silva at the end of his career, you know, he wasn't what he was in the beginning, and he also had a longer career in the beginning of his career. You know what I mean? So we saw the end of his career and and the very end of his career. <laughs> so uh, for they're me, they're studs. They're studs, yeah, but they're not all goats. Studs, so. You know, we're, we're we're picking picking you know strings and threads here, but um, yeah, for me, number five, John Jones. I feel because he didn't uh, maximize all that he could be. I, I absolutely feel like he's right. At, he always was right at the edge. He had the opportunities to just be the goat, but uh, just again and again and again and again, you know, he's he's destroying his opportunity to to create a legacy. You know, and whether he wants to you know believe it or not, you know, that's just what it is. So. For me, John Jones, top five. I still think he has a chance to do things, but I, just the way his fighting looks, it doesn't seem to me like he's going to be able to, you know, climb up that ladder anymore. Um, number four for me is Amanda Nunez. Um, uh, I, I love her as a fighter. I think again, she's she's a uh, way before her time. I think the women's game is still uh, growing and, and and developing, and uh, it's doing it really fast. And thank t- thankfully to people like R- R- Ronda Rousey and. Amanda Nunez, Holly Holm, like these mainstay names, uh, all these girls can come back and and fight all the time. So it's 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 going to evolve. It's going to change. It's going to be just like the men's game in, in its own way that it that it evolves to all round fighters and, sp- and specialized skills. So, uh, but she's definitely my top uh, my top five because she, like you said, she her career is going to go further. She can go up higher in the list. She can be. She will be the greatest woman of all time. I mean, at so. this point, it's it's who do you feed the beast? Right? Who yeah, do you, how do you? Exactly. Who, who? Who? What kind of meat you gonna throw in the lion cage? Sorry. And she's eating, and that's why I think it is right now. She's eating easy <laughs> meals right now. She's easy meals. Easy meals. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't happy meals. It's easy meals. That was. She looked like she could have won seven rounds. Oh man. Who's your three? Uh, my number three is DJ Demetrius Johnson. Uh, I think again, just the where he took the game to. You know, I think it has boosted the flyweight division to a whole another stratosphere. You know, creating he created a Henry Cejudo. You know, he beat him when he was younger. The kid came up. You know, had, same thing with John Dodson. You know, he ended John Dodson's career because he came at the same time as John Dodson. You know, I think anybody else. Yeah, I think that, that would have been that a second great, time was even worse. Right, that's what I mean. I think that would have been a great fight, John Dodson in his prime against the Cejudo. You know, but just the way things meshed up. You know, that's just. You know, how, he knocked how out Dillashaw. And... Exactly. People remember in the Ultimate Fighter finale. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, he, he's a twitchy, but he's a twitchy dude, man. You know, Dodson. And, 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 oof, man. It would have been so good for so, the sport, too. It would be. It would be. So, uh, that's my number three. Uh, my number two is your number one, uh, George St. Pierre. Uh, and for me, I feel as though um, George St. Pierre, not that he had a, a, a short career, but his reign was relatively smaller than others because he decided to maybe retire maybe two, three years, you know, get two, three, four more fights and, and maximize your, your the, the threshold for your greatness. Uh, when you're at that point, you know, when you're at the top of the game, there's no need to go away or to just shut it down unless, you know, you come back for one fight, make it two fights, maybe three fights, and then you can cut it. You know, look at Anderson Silva. He came back for a fight and then it ended up being seven. Uh, and I think that just solidified his legacy, leading no me into my number one. You know, not to cut you off, but um, into Anderson well, Silva. You know, yeah. Anderson Silva, right? Yeah, I think he's just he epitomized to me what Brazilian Bruce Lee would be. You know, he's a lefty. He's he, his first like you can tell he's just a natural on the ground, and he doesn't mind that, and he just. It feels like he's just such a natural on his feet, on the ground, uh, in transition, in his mind, you know, how he plays games, but not outwardly necessarily, like verbally, you know, he plays games to to make that person be involved in his, in whatever he's doing. So it's just unbelievable to watch. I think it's a, like the most pure manifestation of a martial art, you know, yeah. of a con- oh. body control, discipline, and power, oh. speed, 
You know, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. You know what I like about Anderson Silva, Rob? The th I like Anderson Silva because there are some fighters who are so intimidating, you lost the match before it even started, right? Sometimes you go against, like, Francis Ngannou. Already, like, he walks into the cage. I saw fighters um, uh, shaking, like, trying to avoid shaking when he walks. It's like Stone Cold Steve Austin, like the BMF walk, uh, um, except he's huge. But Anderson Silva... There, there are fighters at this at this point in everybody's MMA career. You do, they watch a ton of videotape. They do a lot of homework, and Anderson Silva is very good at not only doing his homework but assessing what the fighters' changed game plan is the first round. He'll measure. He'll see how you swing. He'll move back. He'll do this. He'll do that, and then, at, and then in our, and we watch MMA long enough to be like, oh my God, he knows now. He got him. He got his timing down, and the, because of his the, his physical behavior. He'll look at you, and then he'll start swinging and swinging, and then, and you'll love this. He has, the whole time he has his hands up, has his hands up, and he's doing like these teak kicks or side kicks or, or leg kicks. He'll put both hands down. And when he put both hands down, it's like, oh, shoot, here it comes. Boom, front kick. <laughs> front kick. Uh, that, and that's what the thing I liked about him. He was so good at assessing things somewhere in the beginning and the middle of the first round. And a lot of his first round and second round finishes came from just seeing like, okay, I got this, this guy's timing. I can do this before he can do that. In fact, I got both, I've been leg kicking. I, I got both hands. He's, every time I put my, my left hand up, he's looking at my left. I'm going to just throw a front kick up the middle. <laughs> what the Man, Sick. my favorite, my favorite though. What was your favorite he, silver match? Man, and I watched it the other day. Uh, it was just unbelievable when he was getting just not molly whopped, but man, he was just getting like khabibed by the original Chael khabib, Sonnen. Chael Sonnen. And man, he just triangled him and fought like the end of the middle of the fifth round. Oh man, it honestly looked like he was going to pop his head off. Oh man, it was crazy. I, I, and and again, like you see people try to do certain things. You know, you hear Joe Rogan and the announcers try to explain to you what they're doing. But when Anderson Silva did things, and even George St. Pierre, amazing, unbelievable fighter. But when Anderson Silva did things on on the ground, it was just like he literally had the flexibility. You know, another great great trait to wrap his legs and keep you there and ride your back and ride you and make you like make his weight stay on you as well as being a very talented striker you know so it's just like he's just all over you all the time and i mean i honestly i think he just was old enough to get clipped by weidman and that was just the end of it you know and and um but he man unbelievable run Something at the about us ed New Yorkers, edge of his career <laughs> at the edge of his career Imagine something what about, he was something about us New Yorkers that ruin like everything, right? Like the Patriots are like 18 and 0, Giants right. beat them. <laughs> Anderson Silva, G, the goat, <laughs> uh, Weidman, Weidman caught him with kind of a glancing left. I mean, Weidman's a righty, but he, I mean, I knew, and I, we both know he has power in both hands. But it's one of those things you just hit someone in the right place. Um, about Chael Sonnen, Chael Sonnen said something very interesting about that match. He said the thing he's always hated. When people tap out, or whatever, and the, and then the ref stops the fight, they look at the ref like, "What happened? What happened?" It's, and Chael's like, "Come on, you dork! You know what happened? You right, tapped but... out. What are, you, what are you asking? What happened?" And he said, "And then when it happened to me, what did I do? I asked the referee what happened." <laughs> And when he said you tapped out, I said, I believe you. <laughs> God, the guy is flawed. And the thing, thing I like about Chael is he's flawed and he's totally honest about it. Did he get busted for PEDs? Yeah. And we're going to talk about PED people maybe next week. But the thing I liked about him is that when they asked him, why did you use performance enhancing drugs? He's like, to enhance my performance. <laughs> <laughs> Wild, huh? <laughs> you think I'm gonna use a drug that diminishes my performance? <laughs> the only thing with me about Chael Sonnen is uh, I I have no problem with you know someone being who they are to the one thousand percent you know, but you also don't have to put it in people's face so that you have to defend yourself one thousand percent. I don't I think feel he like did that. There's, I think he there, hit. I think he absolutely says things to incite people so that he can be himself fully, you know, as opposed to 
just yeah. being himself fully and then saying some stuff that's funny on the side if somebody jokes around on you or somebody you know treats you wrong Dude. you just want to change the mood you know but you uh, know don't live off that my you know, favorite I think he lives off it a bit too much talk about q and a's man he's like they're like so so um when he lost to anderson silva one of the fans say so what happened in california he's like what do you mean what happened in California? He said some idiot liberal ran for governor and won. They had no idea he was running as a Republican. <laughs> he bankrupted the state, banged his nanny, and quit. <laughs> Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> talking about Arnold, right? And he's like, are you talking about the travesty that happened when I beat a man up for four rounds? He wraps his legs around my head for 10 seconds, and they call him the winner. <laughs> and then and then I pop for T. They, I supposedly pop for TRT, and they're like... Um, and I'm like, what's the limit supposed to be? They're like 0.6. And they're like, what's your limit? 0.7. You know what I told them? I told them, test it again. They must have caught me on a low day. <laughs> this is TRT. I am a stud, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so you're right. But he didn't, he didn't D-bag anybody. But you're right. He did use this persona to hide behind some things. And now, now he, he still does it. And, me, and to a point where I guess that's just who he is now. That's what he, I mean. He, he can't like, come back. He kind of just, he kind of just lives with that, and yeah. it's just like, all right, man, but that's just not me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Before we move on to the next thing, Molly Karen from ESPN, on the rare occasion you watch this show, as a correction, you announced him as a former champ on two different occasions on, on ESPN's first take. He is not a former champ. He's never won a title, and though, and with the closest being what Rob and I were talking about. Four, four and a half rounds, just, just intelligent fighting against a guy everyone thought. So was going to walk through in less than a round, you know. Um, he backed it up, right? He talked all mm -hmm. that nonsense, and, and he backed it up. So I got to give him that. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. next subject matter. Speaking of first take, this is all over first take this morning and last week. So now uh, it's the elephant in the room. Now I have to talk about the NFL. And more acutely, we got to talk about Drew Brees, all right? Um, Drew Brees found himself in a little hot water about his quote a week ago after saying he will never agree with anybody disrespecting the flag of the United States of America. Which, by the way, he said in 2016, and, he, and, and he's always kept his stance on that. He has since apologized, and actually apologized a second time. Um, his, and his apology goes as such. I love and respect my teammates, and I stand right there with them in regards to fighting for racial equality and justice. I also stand with my grandfathers who risked their lives for this country and countless other military men and women who do this on a daily basis. So people took exception to that because they thought his apology wasn't authentic because he said the second thing. So Rob, your reaction to his apology and what, what, you, what you, not not reading people's mind, but what you think other people may think. Uh, so I think the apology was necessary. That's why it was probably written up for him by a publicist and, you know, and it's nothing against that, you know, but he's got to say the right words because he said the wrong words already. And I, I, I honestly, I saw a little bit of how the interview started. And for me, I feel like not that I'm not going to give him a bone or anything, but I think he kind of just didn't really was it wasn't really just addressing the question. I don't think he said anything wrong. I think that this is what's happening is that the message you is getting. You didn't think he missed. got the question? Yeah, like I really because he, he he he. It seemed like he was stuck on a certain aspect of of what was being said, and it was just like I'm going to talk about this. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't, you know. The thing is, is it's not about, uh, it wasn't even about really, it was about Colin Kaepernick. It wasn't about the flag. And, and that's still what people bring it to. And that's why it's like, it wasn't even about Colin Kaepernick and the flag. It was about pre police brutality. And so, it, to me. And that's why we didn't think he got the question, right? Right. That's why it's just like, uh, maybe this is, that's the problem is that, uh, you know, you hear a little bit of the pro. You know, you hear that oh, it's that problem again, and you and you go right to the issue that you're most you know comfortable with. But um, yeah, I mean, I think Drew Brees and anybody else. And I think the real conversation is not about how are you going to be an activist or how are you going to do things uh, to physically to change the environment around you. It's about having the conversations with the people who don't have those conversations. You know. If you're in an environment and you start to realize, like, wow, I don't experience that all the time, start to have those conversations with people around those area. The best thing Drew Brees can do is talk to people around his circles, probably people that have 
similar monetary values as he does he certainly, and he can get those people involved right he certainly you know, has um, an, a, a, an available slew of people right it's not like right. he doesn't he have anyone to reach out to i mean right. the NFL and we're not like, telling him that he's got to save new orleans by himself you know it's just the fact that you're there you're helping that's great now you don't have to money is not everything it's not like you're buying you know you're you're buying uh presents for kids to buy their happiness like you need we need the activism comes from the conversations and and holding a position strong you know um i i agree a thousand percent i was disgusted that people were burning american flags that is unbelievably disgraceful i draw the line uh, there absolutely anything that has to do with disrespecting the flag the 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 difference was there wasn't a disrespect to the flag there was a disrespect of the anthem if anything to of the Colin Kaepernick and like it's been reported time and time again it wasn't disrespectful because he asked how do I how do I not be disrespectful that's clearly the intent to not have disrespect if people felt a certain way about it that's what was intended but we're not trying to anybody's not trying to make anybody else unhappy but if we're unhappy and you're not then that's like whoa hold on like let's both either both of us are going to be unhappy or we're all going to be happy you know that's that's really what it's all about yeah i don't mean to put a so, debbie downer in their day nope so. no so that's 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 how i feel about drew man it's like he just needs to uh step up to the plate in his personal life and the people that he's around normally yeah you can do it with your family that's great but the people you see each and every day when you see things happen don't just sit back have the conversations even in a personal setting you see something happen you don't got to step up in public and, and and bear down on somebody you know step to the side bring it to the room be like hey uh i'm interested let's go out you know have a drink after work you know or or you know go somewhere and talk and just you know figure out what was going on in your head because i, I don't agree with what you were talking about and that's all that needs to start happening confrontation in in a, in a real manner so come on you you can pick us all up man yeah man Listen, there are, and this is important because we're both going to have closing comments about this at the end, so I'm going to save a lot of this uh, for the end because it's connected. Rob, you are a black man, and you're also white. I came out of the womb of a black woman, and I have a white father. Grew up on Flappish Avenue, and I, I identified most of my life being black, and I will just say right now, for now, I'm every bit as black as I am white, for whatever that's worth. Um, so that's where I'm coming from when I say what I'm about to say. There is things. There are things that people say that are insensitive because they're ignorant, and it's forgivable. Because they're ignorant, they don't know any better. Um, we both admit, he, I don't even think he fully comprehended the question. You know what I'm saying? And everybody's like, no, he was asked that question years ago and he had the same answer. No, he was asked the same way. He's going to answer the same way, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so there are people that are ignorant and then when their eyes are open and when their head's not in the water, all they can do is say, hey, look, I'm sorry. I want to understand more. I want to learn more. And then we as a society decide if we forgive him or not, which is crazy because, you know, um, on a, I guess on this political issue where it, what he said affects his fans and the people who respect him and, and his black uh, counterparts. Uh, um, it's important to, to see someone and say and know the difference between, oh, no, you said that because that's in your heart. And, there's, and another way is, oh, you said that because of what's not in your head. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> and for those of you that fall into the false dichotomy, that think that you, you're, it's either one or the other, you're full of shit. You're full of shit. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's one. Sometimes it's the other. Sometimes it's neither. This man, because he has military uh, 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 family, people who, pay, who, who put their lives on the line and live or pay the ultimate price. The flag means something different to them. So when you see someone putting up a flag and playing the national anthem, their brain instinctively, without thinking, is like, oh shit, this guy's disrespecting the flag. Because their brain is steered that way. Not because they're thinking that it, that it, uh, that it should go that way. It's instinct. 
It's instinct, right? When Rob calls some, look, when someone comes by you and says the N-word, it's instinct you pop them in the mouth. You're not thinking maybe I should punch this dude or 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 should I, I, will I get arrested for assault? No, instinctively, pop, pop, three piece in a soda, <laughs> okay? Um, so I think, oh, okay, that ends our live video. Um, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, no, but I think it came from not what's in his heart. Because when people say, oh, you said it, so, so that's, and it's probably because that's when you, in your heart. That's that we're saying you're just a, you're just a racist and, 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 and you're not sorry. And that's bullshit. It, came, it didn't come from what's in his heart. It came from what was not in his head. There's the ignorant and there's the stupid. Ignorant, you don't know better. I get it. You apologize. You know what? I accept. What can I do to help? That's that. Those are the people we want in our lives. Those are the people we want in our lives. The stupid, when you educate them on the difference, because you, Rob, you just said in the beginning, right? No, taking a knee has nothing to do with disrespecting the flag. And and at this point, uh, with with the with the education, I'm ending this video. But this point with the education and people making themselves aware of these differences and these acute differences and and these uh, these obtuse differences. At this point, people have to know that. They can't pretend that they can't keep saying, oh, he's disrespecting the flag because th those people are stupid because they've been educated and mindfully aware of the differences and they're set in their own way. No, I'm thinking what I'm thinking. And for that, I'm name calling right now. You, they are stupid, stupid people. Look at me, stupid. So um, Drew Brees gets a pass. He apologized. Some forgive him, some don't. The ones that won't forgive him, that's fine. That's fine. And I you mean, know, and and you please. know, time will tell. You know, I I, I I like I agree with you a thousand percent. I think it, it, he'll, you know, go forward going forward. It'll be a little different. But uh, even to piggyback on that point about uh, you know the dichotomy, is that it can be eight different ways, <laughs> and, and everybody can feel the exact same thing. And what it really is about is meeting in the middle. If you have an issue, it's not only your issue. That's it. You have to find compromise. You know, it's, 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 it's comical because being in a relationship, you start to understand about compromise. And if you can't compromise, it will never work. It's the same thing with solving a problem. Like, if you can't compromise for yourself and then say, hey, will you compromise? You're not going to compromise? Okay, you're the problem. That's where, you know, problem solving doesn't really, you know, do anything. Uh, it's just appeasement at that point. So... You know, some people, we just got to really stand firm on certain beliefs and work f towards a common goal. You know, it can, you don't have to, uh, it doesn't have to, you don't have to abolish the police department. But if those same police officers are going to be involved in a project to, to learn about public safety, absolutely. You know, but don't get lost in the idea of defund the police. It's not about defunding this police. It's about transferring in funds from the from the government to the community to protect the community. Agreed. You know, that's yeah. so. Again, you know, how many about, different advantages. How about let's make the salaries bigger? You know what? Because you, you know what happens if if you know what happens if you if you make police salaries competitive, smarter people become police officers. <laughs> Right, you need X amount of people for this precinct. Listen, then I mean, it's not a good old boys club of billionaires. It's it's uh, for I mean, there are police uh, precincts where they train their people, where the uh, the the training is extensive and it's longer uh, because they they realize they're servants of the people. Serve and protect. So you know, serve and protect. Don't just uphold the law. You're not robo. Like, remember what I said last week you're not robocop. So so yeah, to me, look, Breeze gets a pass. And Breeze, as far as do, as making up making up what he did, he's got some making up to do, but he's got a surrounding, a slew of people surrounding him that will hold him accountable to that making up. And he's willing to do it. And this is what unites us. You got a guy who sees who sees, you know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I'm and, and I'm and for years my head was in the sand because because people died. Because that's what people do, by the way. They use the fact that people died and make the illogical cross crossing that it has something to do with this and that, you know, like um, like um, JFK, right? If if someone thinks that Osbo Os Oswald didn't act alone, you're disrespecting. All of a sudden, people accuse you of disrespecting someone because someone died, but that's not what's ha what's happening. So, um, I mean, thousands of cases of unreported police, you know, just harassment. 
you know, educational system, criminal justice system. You know, it goes further than that. You know, but continue. Sorry. No, that's it. I think we took it as far as we could go. I mean, the, we, the question was asked. I, I do think I do believe he's authentically apologetic. And for the, the, those that don't want to forgive him, that's fine. He'll, he'll work on it. He'll work on it. All right. And if you still don't, that's fine, too. <laughs> All right. I mean, some people some people have the right to be upset. Yeah, there was a woman on ESPN who was talking about white privilege, but she says, I'm not talking about white privilege. She says, I have a, a million dollar home. I got a swimming pool in the back. I, I recognize that I have privilege too, you know? Right. So and that's, um, and that, that's that important to notice issue. too, right? That's a great issue. I think that, and I, that's why I try to say to people is that I, I agree with all this, that there is racism. There are things happening. And there are some people that are trying to push the message a little further than that, but you can't say that there is not racism. There is a bigger issue, which is classism, mm -hmm. which is those who have and those who do not. And that's what we're talking about, about yeah. people who have privilege. And you can talking... have privilege, and that's what I'm saying. The, the small amount of privilege that's had in racism is one, pe one sort of people talking down to another sort of people. Racism happens in Muslim culture as well. M uh, racism happens in the, the step system in India. Uh, and it happens all over the world. But the, the thing is... is fighting back against injustice and against inequality and giving love to all equally. And if you can just hold very simple principles, you can start to see where the laws are a lot different than human morals. And I think that's really what's going to start changing. You know, they say this is the generation of change. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, we just have to survive the cancel culture. <laughs> Yeah, um, very, very, very well said. And I think, and tolerance, this is not the time to say this, but tolerance has to work both ways because people that don't know or are unaware are not racist. Some of them, they just don't, they don't know because they don't know. <laughs> They're ignorant. And I don't it's like to use the word ignorant because people think now. ignorant and stupid are the same thing. Yeah, and but, people, they, but you can't, you can't not know you, though. Yeah. It, it's, it's, there's phones now. You can't yeah. not know. You know, so this is that time. And if they don't know, now you know, right? And if they don't yeah. know tomorrow, now we know. We got to keep educating people. And listen, a black people who think who think they're white whisperers because they're 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 the black guy everyone keeps white guys keep coming to to ask. Um, just do it. Just do it. You know why? Because we don't want them white guys trying to solve this problem on their own. Because that's what got everybody in this mess in the first place. All right. Mm -hmm. This has mm -hmm. there has. I like I like white whisperers. <laughs> Ooh, did you hear the horn? I heard it. <laughs> As a horn saying, hey, let's get moving, man. We got shit to do. Let's All do right, it. we only got three questions for good idea, bad idea, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, let me set it up. And... All right, Rob. A good idea, bad idea. It's time. Kittle wants more, more money than tight end money. Good idea, bad idea. What a dumb, um, what a dumb question. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Great idea. I think he should always get as much money as he should. But bad idea for the San Francisco 49ers. I just don't think you can put that much money in that position uh, with other positions needing more uh, top dollars. For me, I say good idea, but I say so with caution. Um, like you said, they gave Garoppolo a whole lot of money, Jimmy G, you know. And they still need some talent in the wide receiver position, though I thought they drafted intelligently uh, or, and signed, signed free agents and traded intelligently. But when you think about good tight ends in the NFL, you think of Kelsey, Travis Kelsey, and you think about Kittle. And these tight ends are doing a wide receiver's job and doing a, a tight end's job. So, um, And I'm never one to mess with any, anybody's money, so San Francisco 49ers, pay the man. Rob, good idea, bad idea. John Jones saying uh, that he will give up the USC belt. Um, <laughs> no, man. Uh, bad idea because the UFC somehow continues to give this guy chance after chance after chance after chance after he continues to do bad stuff after bad stuff. So I think he should just keep going with the, you know, keep, keep – you know, driving the gravy train where it needs to go and get his money because they ain't ever going to let him go. He's, he's, their, he's their golden boy.
Yeah, that's what people like Vince McMahon and Dana White do. They keep they keep their people so they don't they don't go to the competitors like Bellator or one championship. A little history lesson on John Jones, and I'll do the short version. Basically, think of Antonio Brown for the NFL, and I give you John Jones. All right, John Jones wants more money to fight heavyweight, and I don't blame him. All right, you want to you want him to fight Francis Ngannou. The risk has to be worth the reward. The reward. His star power is not Connor, not not Ronda, but nobody's going to be. But there is a halfway point in the happy gray area where you could pay John Jones. John Jones. Bad idea. Don't retire. All right, Rob. Question number three and the final question. Good idea. Bad idea. Speaking of retiring, uh, Conor McGregor um, saying that he's done. Thanks. Basically, thanks for the cheese. Conor, Conor McGregor retiring. Good idea. Bad idea. Um, good idea because I feel like he can take those uh, small those those super fights to Bellator, to one, to boxing, and just do one super fight a year and just get bank, you know? So I think he can do a great amount of things with not being hampered down by a UFC contract, especially talking about how they've been trying to get everybody to get these lower paid deals, and you have all these fighters that are uh, retiring now instead of taking them. I think it's a great idea for him. I think now's a good a time as any, right? He's a father right now. He's got a kid. He's already made more money in a short amount of time than, than the t than we just named our t our goats, our top five our top five fighters of all time. I mean, he's made more in the short time than all four all all of them in their career combined put together. So, um, you're young, right? You want to read to your children. Don't want to uh, take the risk of sustaining any brain damage. Floyd Mayweather made bank. You know you're gonna get murked by by Khabib if you come back. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, finished on a high note, right? Knocked out Donald Cerrone. Uh, um, and won with class, right? Uh, there was no real douchism between him and whatever because Cerrone is kind of a, a, a Conor McGregor kind of guy, right? A guy who sh shows up, uh, last minute fights, doesn't like uh, say, you know, I can't do it because my big toe hurts. So, um, yeah, good, good, good results. And John Jones, bad idea. Don't retire or don't, don't give up your belt. Conor McGregor, good idea. Retire. All right, let me do that, and we're back. All right, um, good podcast. Hey, good episode today, Rob. Um, is there any, uh, we have uh, finishing thoughts, and I think I'd like to go first. Sure. On this one. Um, I wrote this on my Facebook post, and since it's blown up, um, uh, me just breaking my silence on this whole kneeling and the rioting and this and that, and I've just l listened to a lot of people go back and forth. A lot of close friends, a lot of intelligent friends who are, some are navigated by their political beliefs that which determine their opinions, and some are just, just human beings just trying to make sense of it all. Um, and like uh, Jason Olive and Casey Jennings is just ridiculous. It's just two, two alpha on, yeah. males, just two alpha males just butting heads going back and forth where... Um, now all of a sudden you're not attacking the argument you're attacking um someone's character the, the person, and it's gotten too too yeah, personal and, too and, and i hope i hope both of them could cul culpable a little bit but jo a little bit more man because jo you know his sometimes his passion you know like just winning an argument's not enough he feel like he got to crush it and casey's casey's not that kind of guy you know case casey casey you knock on because you come to your house <laughs> um but love them. But, but again, an example, both. I have friends. I have friends that just have crazy ideas. And that's just who they are. And it is what it is. I'm not picking a side on that. I, I, I can't. And you know, they're both right. And they're both full of shit. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I said it. <laughs> All right. Um, as someone who is black and white, someone who has family brutalized by the police and has family that served in a police force, for, us, for someone who served in the military saluting the flag, and respect people who kneel during the national anthem. It's my turn to talk. First, at this point, there's entirely too much information, and I mentioned this to you before, Rob, too much education and information out there that shows that kneeling is not disrespecting the flag. The flag means something different to me because I served. The flag means something different to me because it is a reminder uh, that there's an ideal and a commitment to freedom uh, and the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Um, that the flag resembles as, as a symbol. And yes, in its ideals and its pure nature, I strongly believe in my heart of hearts it's worth dying for. With that being said, this is supposed to apply to all Americans, Rob. Please read that part again. All Americans. If a race or an ethnicity is not being heard and is systematically not getting their fair shake, 
If they have to watch their back, securing the knowledge that one wrong move might cost them their lives, then action must be taken that will inconvenience others. Kneeling in a protest is the American way, Rob. Demonstrations? That's more of a national pastime than baseball is. <laughs> and if you choose to remain willfully ignorant to something that is as conspicuous as it is important to our American way of life collectively, and those people that disagree with, agree with that, you're disrespecting the flag. What is the greatest form of patriotism? Dissension. And though violence and looting is not the answer, and we both agree on that, Yes, white people, black people agree with you on that. We ain't trying to loot our own stores, okay? Civil unrest is par for the course, the American way. Ignorance I can tolerate. Protected ignorance, I will not. Second, do all lives matter? And I see you back there, Miranda. Do all lives matter? Sure, but when someone is shot jogging, when someone is tased for the fun of it, when someone gets the life choked out of them, when we all know in our heart of hearts these scumbag officers not worthy of the badge did it because they're not looking at someone like as a human being, it's very important that someone says black lives matter and everybody else shut up. That is the opportunity for, for you to get over yourselves and recognize that symbolism and, and to recognize the symbolism and respect the activism. Lastly, and this is the most important thing, and we said this during the podcast, if someone does or says something they don't fully comprehend and they are regretful and apologetic, please learn to forgive. Sometimes they are not exposed. Sometimes their error and apology are explicit as they are open and notorious. And sometimes uh, what they're saying does not derive from what's in their heart. Sometimes what they're saying derives from what is not in their freaking head. <laughs> and I don't care who you are. I don't care who you vote for. You know that everything I said is right. Listen to each other. Have empathy. Empathy. Love each other. Stand together as much as you can. And that's all I got. I am a patriot. I am a father. I am God-fearing and I love you all. Um, so my rant is just uh, basically to just be educated. Um, and the news is an indication um, that... When you see, when you have a, a, a news story about protesting, there's a big difference between protesters, between arson, between looters. Uh, when I think about going out to a, um, <clears throat> a protest or going out these last couple of days, um, it's kind of, it's hard for me to go out, but it's even harder to think about setting a store on fire or even harder to think about robbing people or robbing people's stores right it's like uh just because i want to be a protester does not make me a criminal um peaceful protesting should be allowed no matter what um that is a, a basic fundamental of our country that's what we were born on our, our country was born on is that we want fair representation we are allowed to protest we're allowed to bear arms and the fact that people are can even talk about, you know, gun control or stuff like that at this time, even if we had pistols, it still wouldn't matter. You know, even if we weren't allowed to have ARs, it still wouldn't matter. It has nothing to do with the conversation. It's always about police brutality. It's always about getting gunned down or not being able to just live a peaceful life without being harassed. Um, so for me, just allow people to protest. Don't protest their protesting. If you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to hear what they're saying, just don't listen. You know, go about your day, and we'll come through, and we'll change your mind eventually. And we're going to change what's going to happen around the country. So no matter what, everybody's going to have to do things a lot differently. But the way to change is not through violence. It's through understanding how to take action. Right? Uh, the only thing that we need to do as a populace is to organize. Organize. So, again, let's keep processing, let's keep that movement going, and let's organize to create a movement, to create political change in our country, which has been created on great foundations, but needs to be tweaked for all Americans. Right? I don't want to live as a black man. I don't want to live as a white man. I want to live as an American citizen. 
you know. So that's just how it is. And Amen. Amen. Then all lives will matter. Amen. You know? and, th and only then, well, I mean, only then, or at least close enough to then, all lives matter. Because it's not just about black people, it's, it's about it's Native Americans. You know? <clears throat> Nobody talks about Native Americans, but you go to the middle of the country, that they're being, you know, uh, prosecuted for their own type of beliefs and, and, and livelihood when they gave most of this country to us. So... Yeah. Or it was taken from them, let's say, yeah. <laughs> in a realistic manner. Yeah. So, Thank you for allowing yourself to go this route, okay? This is a sports debate show, and we talk about volleyball. That's our wheelhouse. We talk about MMA. We love the NFL. We're loving the, what the NBA has become the last few few years. Baseball had some excitement. So, um, But when, when these people come through our window with this stuff, we have to address it. And sometimes... You know, I'm not saying I was a coined animal, but I did I did sit silent on it because I just wanted to see how things unfold and listen to people and, and whatever. And the, the important thing that both of us said is just listen to each other. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a vet who, who still feels that Colin Kaepernick shouldn't kneel. All right. He's um, not racist. He's not stupid. He's he's just deeply convicted in, in his beliefs. He's not dangerous either. He's he's there's this gray area where there are vets out there who disagree with what he's doing, but acknowledge that everything we fought for and put our lives on the line is so he can do that. All right. We both agree free speech is not always a good idea, but that is not a dumb form of free speech. That is intelligent. And in this, in this, day, this day, day and age, super necessary. And we said a week ago, he's looking pretty damn good right now. Mm -hmm. Right. We said history will be, will be kinder to him than than the present tense, which when he did when he did that. Roger Goodell just apologized today from for the NFL that they didn't do enough. And of course, cancel culture is going to decide whether they accept his apology or not. But like you said, as far as apology is concerned, the proof's in the pudding. What are you learning? Who are you talking to? What are you going to do now? You know, or what are you going to say up up to this point? Right. Love you. Would well, love you, Rob. Rob McLean, okay. man. That's my dude. Hi. <laughs> right. Hey, we wrap up like that. Listen, be safe out there. All right? If, if wherever you are, if you're allowed to play some volleyball, get out there and get it. If you're allowed out there to pepper, pepper. If you need to empty the car out of the garage and do a little, little military ring of fire, do some mountain climbers, some box jumping, get the house music or whatever music, um, advanced level music. <laughs> Medi okay, moderate is hip-hop. Advanced is house <laughs> as far as reps are concerned. Be totally. careful out there. Be good out there. And for my boy, Rob, keep it McLean. McLean, I am Jason DeBeas. This is episode 20 of Sports Debate Tuesday. We're out. Come check out the Option Podcast on OptionDB.com. It's also available on iTunes and Spotify and on YouTube under the NY Varsity Sports Handle. You're going to love what you hear.